I'll I tell you about how sermons come about, okay, in the Westfall world. Um, we know where we're going in the Bible, but I always go, Lord, you know, show me something, you know, in my life this week that uh, that'll work, you know, that kind of applies to the to the message. And uh, um, I thought that this week was the don't be led into temptation. So I was looking for that, and then Jeremy told me about halfway through the week, no, 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 it's the forgive us, forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses. I went, oh, I've been looking in the wrong area uh, in my life then um, for a good story. And then, so, okay, so Eileen had her uh, spinal surgery Wednesday morning, early, and uh, in the hospital Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Friday, and the, the doctor came in Friday afternoon and said, you know, you think you can go home? Maybe your husband can take care of you? And I said, sure, you know, <laughs> it's what I do. And so um, I must have that genetic caretaking thing in me. And so, um, so I, we got her all up and ready to go and rolled her out in the wheelchair and um, got her home and um, and they'd give me a prescription for pain pills, and uh, and she said, I, I've got some at home. They're in the they're in the medicine bottle with the uh, timer on the top. So I've got a few of those, so we can start with those before you get the prescription. So I went, cool. I found that, dug it out. Every you know, a couple of hours. And she, the more we went, she kept complaining about the pain, and it just was racking her. And uh, four or five times in the night, she. she woke up, she couldn't stand the pain, and I kept going and saying, you know, it hadn't been two hours since I gave you, you know, we got a timer. That's when she started calling me Hitler, right then, you know. <laughs> the, uh, and so, uh, worse, and I keep trying to get, every time I touch her, every time I try and move her, she'd cry in pain, and, and I, what is the problem? But I, I kept giving her the pills, and she got dopier and dopier, you know how people do, and couldn't form words very well, and seemed confused a lot, and, uh, I was going, man, oh man, this is by three o'clock yesterday afternoon, she's trying to find the doctor's number to get put back in the hospital, because she goes, this, I can't take the pain another minute. And his name was Dr. Rowe, and all she could find in her confused state was <laughs> Jeremy Cole. <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't help him. Uh, and I thought, well, Doc, I, and I looked at the bottle, and I'd been giving her tranquilizers <laughs> instead of pain pills for 24 <laughs> hours. <laughs> and I didn't know if I should tell her that. <laughs> Let's confess your sins one to another. And uh, I raced over to Dave Schuster's pharmacy and uh, got got her, her meds, and uh, they, they gave me a word of advice. They said, let's just say one thing to you. Read the label. <laughs> so anyway, so I am carrying this great guilt, this load. I, I, nurse Deborah, who was so kind to come to the pre-op and everything, she said, no, John, you're not Hitler. You're Dr. Mingala. <laughs> <laughs> you did the torture work for Hitler. Yeah. You, did, you made it so far worse. So I'll, and I'm going, Lord, you know, I don't even want to tell this story. He goes, no, I think you better tell it. It's time to confess. It's time, you know, and maybe there'll be forgiveness, you know, uh, down the road. As of 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon, she started doing much better. Uh, she could stop the excruciating pain that I had inflicted on her. So um, so let that be a lesson. If any of you ever think of calling uh, the Rev, you know, if you have a need or anything, just think twice. <laughs> you, know, you never know. So um, we are talking about uh, the Lord's Prayer in our series we've had. Um, chapter 6 of Matthew. Whoops, there was a paper. There's a paper. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 6. We've looked at this before. Beginning of verse 7, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word how we might uh, be forgivers and we might be forgiven and set free by your grace. That's our need and that's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Well, Jesus is teaching us how to pray, right? And uh, we begin with uh, acknowledging that, that God is not us. God's different from us and is holy and uh, and yet we have this intimate relationship, our Heavenly Father, um, and that He has an intention for us, and that, and that we invite His uh, kingdom, His rule, His presence, His character to permeate our world uh, like it is in heaven. And then last week we looked at how um, we can trust God day by day uh, for our needs for that day, and uh, without uh, obsessing about the past or worrying about the, the future, but for today, uh, he will meet our needs. And, you know, it's interesting for me because, you know, I, I shared that with you last week. And then I went into this week in hell, uh, Damien in the uh, uh, treatment center and Eileen's uh, um, surgeries and all these things. And I literally had to pray that prayer that we talked about last week several times a day. Like, okay, Lord, uh, meet us where we are right now. Give us what we need today. That's, that's it. Just give us what we need today. We'll get through today. And, uh, and I decided philosophically, since Tuesday was the worst day of my life, that any day since then is going to be better. You know, you've got a relative thing on that. And, uh, and so... Um, so I'm doing okay, day by day by day. But now we come to this, um, forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, um, as we uh, forgive other people's debts and sins and trespasses. And, and I realized that not only does God care about today and providing for us, but he's also giving us what we need to handle yesterday. Literally yesterday for me, uh, figuratively yesterday for y'all, uh, but the things of our past that, that have shaped us and held us back and imprisoned us or defined us or uh, worked damage in relationships and uh, have made our life what it is, is saying we need to ask for forgiveness, to accept forgiveness to the same uh, degree that, that we give it. Now, um, couple of things when we look, when we look at this. Um, forgiveness is, uh, is really, really important. We know that, and it's also very troubling um, in a lot of ways. And, you know, I think in some ways, forgiveness is probably God's antidote for our brokenness, uh, for the losses that we accumulate in our life, um, for the damage that's been done or the, that we've done. It's, it's God's... Uh, healing antidote for that. And, and so there's a great need for it, um, but there's a couple of ways that, that we resist um, receiving and extending that forgiveness. And the first one comes to my mind is, um, uh, okay, here's a little confession. Okay. Um, it's really hard for me to ask for forgiveness when I know I'm right. <laughs> is that selfish? <laughs> you know? And I remember uh, years ago, I was working in another church here in town, and uh, there were some people who just, they were, they were having a uh, meltdown of hatred for me and resentment and everything. And, uh, and my boss uh, met with them, met with me, met with us together, all those things, and, and finally took me aside and he said, hey, why don't you just apologize and let's get on with our life? I mean, what do you mean apologize? I'm right. <laughs> I'm right in this. I don't have to apologize. And he did that. I know, I know, I know, I know. John, you can be right and you can be well, but you can't be both. If you want to get on with your life and be well, give up your need to be right here. Just apologize. I went, okay, I will. But I am right. <laughs> so I'm going on record. I am right. I'll apologize just to get this off your plate. But 
I'm right. <laughs> I really, you know, th that goes on in little ways and big ways all the time. I'm, I'm good at forgiving others, you know, when they when they come to me, especially, you know, if if they'll come and wallow a little bit, you know, and make themselves miserable, make me feel a little better, you know, then I'm quick to forgive them. Wouldn't you be? It's a little harder to do that when they don't come and ask for it, right? Because I go, I'll forgive them when they recognize that I was right, you know. Yeah, that rarely happens. That never happens, ever. But um, this need to be right, I think, permeates our whole culture. If we can give ourselves the evidence that we're not as wrong as they are, then we're free from forgiving. And we're free from being forgiven. And so we can basically live without this prayer. Isn't that something? This is a prayer we could do. We could not have to pray because we're right. Now, the, the downside of that is that we'd be sick people, you know, and, uh, and our relationships would be sick and everything, everything would be sick. Uh, so maybe Jesus wants us to be free of that and be a little more healthy. So uh, we have to set aside. I have to set aside my need to be right. There's another thing in me, though, and that is that I was raised by a, a kind of a self-made man, my dad, you know. And uh, he was tough and uh, hard and, uh, and he built his life and everything. And, and he taught me to be that way. And so... I often think, you know, I don't think I need to pray, forgive me my debts, because I'll figure out a way to pay them off myself. I'll figure out a way to work this out. I'll solve this problem. I'll make, I don't need forgiveness. I'll just, I just need a new plan where I can jump in and do some things and work some stuff and then won't need forgiveness. Because I could be a hard, tough, self-made man then. Too. And Jesus is saying, you know, I'd sure like to release you from that. I'd sure like to save you from that and have you actually be free and not have to uh, pay all the debts yourself, pay for all the sins yourself. In fact, he says, that's kind of stupid because I've already done it. So every Easter, Jesus reminds me how stupid I am. Uh, in trying to pay my own debts and negotiate my way out of every problem. Now, last week we looked at the give us this day our daily bread, right? And one of the things that came out in that is that we're not praying for ourselves. We're not saying give me my daily bread because in that uh, Hebrew culture um, there was a sense of community and so when, when one person had bread it was shared we all had bread when one was lacking we all were lacking and and that same thing now comes into our prayer for forgiveness right forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors right um, the idea that we are sinful people among sinful people is so richly biblical um, the Old Testament, uh, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And, uh, and he said, I, I am a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And as soon as this uh, uh, prophet saw his vision of God, the first thing he thought of is, I'm unclean and so is everybody around me. We are all in this together. And, uh, and I think about that and I go, we, we dare not lose the concept that, uh, that we need forgiveness. Um, not enough just to confess your sin. It's, it's, uh, or, or to ask for forgiveness for yourself and not ask for forgiveness for the people around you. Now, this is also a very weird prayer. Okay, it's a weird part of the prayer, and that is because this is the only part of the prayer that is uh, conditional. 
you know, when we talk about unconditional love and, you know, God loves us unconditionally and all these things, this part of the prayer is the only one that's unconditional. That makes me really uncomfortable. I'm, I'm tempted to say Jesus probably got it wrong, but maybe he was being intentional here. Um, forgive us our sins to the same degree we forgive others their sins. In fact, we're saying, Lord, I'll take the lead here. I'll forgive people, and then you just forgive me to the same extent I'm forgiving others. Okay, Lord? That, that's what our prayer is, literally. Follow me, Lord, as I'm forgiving. Bring your forgiveness to me. As I'm not forgiving, hold your forgiveness back. That's what this prayer literally is saying. And uh, I really would prefer it to be, Lord, forgive us our sins and lead us not in temptation, right? See, wouldn't it be great to just cut it right off there? Edit, delete, bring it together, and then we'd have a smooth running prayer. But we have this, to the same degree we forgive, forgive us. Oh, that's tougher. That's tougher because sometimes it's it's uh, easier to think of getting yourself forgiven and holding the resentments for others. There's a there's a sort of a poetic balance in that. Hold resentments, acquire forgiveness. Hold resentments. That's sort of the game that we play. Jesus is saying, I'll have none of that. It's, it's like there's this, when, there, when there's uh, debts, trespasses, and sins, there's like this chasm between us and other people, uh, between us and the people we love even. Un unforgiveness, uh, the, the damages that were done, the, the debts that have accumulated. There's, there's damage done, and there's this chasm, and the dramatic picture of Easter that we're going towards is that Christ on the cross, that the, the beams of the cross bridge the chasm and, and, and open a, a way to connect and get through to God, to the people we love, care for the people uh, we've hurt and damaged, all those things, that, that there's now a chasm. Now, if we say, I'm not going to forgive, Lord, so you don't have to forgive me, that's like taking a stick of dynamite and blowing up the cross over the chasm. Like the good, bad, and the ugly, you know, we used to do. We detonate the bridge that God gave us in Christ. Now, what happens? What does Jesus do when we detonate that bridge of the cross and blow it up? You know what he does? He lays the cross right back over it again and says, Will you trust me now? Will you let me love you now? I thought I blew that up. Yeah, you did. Now, here it is. Now, now will you trust me? And so I was thinking about this. Uh, what makes this so difficult? I think as I <clears throat> pondered this one, sometimes it's hard to forgive ourselves. It's easier to forgive others. It's hard to forgive ourselves and the damages that we've done. And... Uh, and we go, I know Jesus died for my sins, and I know, I believe that, and you know, uh, we're good Christians, but we still are shaped and held back by the losses and the damage done. Right? And I believe that it probably, to forgive ourselves, to, to receive forgiveness, is probably one of the greatest acts of courage that you and I could ever do. It's an act of courage to, to take hold of the freedom that is ours in Christ and not fall back into our own patterns and our own messages to ourselves and all those things. I had this uh, good friend years ago, uh, Jim Dykus was his name, and uh, he was a, a pastor in Florida. And we'd get together a couple times a year and share about things. I was doing single dump ministries when we met. He had this huge single dump ministry in Florida. Hundreds and hundreds of people involved. And I always thought, I don't get this guy totally. He's really nice. He's really kind. He's really loving. And he's really sensitive and tuning into people. 
with all the things I'm not, you know. And so I, it was, I, was, I liked being with him and everything, but I always thought, yeah, what's the story, you know? And, and I think part of it was he dressed odd to me. We're in Florida, no kidding, sitting around by the pool, and he's got dress shirt, sweater, tie, by the pool. I'm in my bathing suit, as you should be. <laughs> and, uh, and we're talking and everything, and, uh, and, I, and I said, you know, Jim, I did, tell me your story. He said, no, maybe I'll just show you. And he thought for a minute, then he, he pulled off his sweater and took off his shirt. And my gosh, his whole body was covered with prison tats, tattoos, the rough ones burned on. And his arms and his body and his back, it was like, what the heck? This nice assembly of God, church pastor in Florida? And I said, uh, you want to tell me about it? And he said, no. Uh, I want you to read something first, and then and then we can talk. Why don't you read something first? Okay. So I went home. When I got home, uh, there was a package for me that had a book um, that Jim Dykus had written, and um, I want I want to share a couple of things from it because um, it has to do with how difficult it is to accept forgiveness and yet how powerful it is. He said, I remember a morning in the middle of the winter when I stood in front of a mirror in a Salvation Army Men's Social Service Center dormitory bathroom. That morning I faced the reality of the man I'd become. I knew nobody wanted me. Both my parents had died because of me. My sister slammed the door in my face every time I tried to make contact with her. Aunts and uncles refused to admit that I belonged in their family. Four ex-wives despised me. Four little children were being protected from the contemptible man who was their father. Not even the hospitals, jails, and rehab programs wanted me anymore. Even the men on the street who were using the drugs had once been my only friends. They didn't want me. As I looked in that mirror, the desperate loneliness of not being wanted permeated every fiber of my being. Every hope was gone. I didn't even want myself. I hated and despised the man I was. I'd been handcuffed many times. I'd been bound in straitjackets. But the bondage that I felt that morning to the pain-filled memories of 15 years of drug addiction thrust me beyond all hope into the very pit of hell. But on January 21st, my life was changed. That day, when I cried out one more time for help, my simple cry introduced me to someone who did want me. I met Jesus Christ, the only one who had the power to set me free from all my bondages and declare me not guilty forevermore. He sent me a note with a book that said, I know you and Eileen's birthday is January 21st. That's also my born again birthday, which is cool. Now, as he was experiencing forgiveness and trying to, and get it, he decided he would go back to uh, the spot on the train tracks where his mother had uh, stepped in front of the train and killed herself the day that he was uh, locked up in the Illinois State Prison. And he, he wanted to go back to that site and to see if he could um, experience that. And so he's writing about it and he says, I'm about 200 yards away, but I know where I'm going. I'm going to the place. It's almost over, I told myself. I never thought I'd be coming back here. I never thought I could stand the pain. And suddenly I was there. My feet stopped of their own accord, and I felt as though a cage had dropped down and closed me in it. I stood still at exactly the spot where Mom had died so many years before. But even though I stood there, I felt removed. I felt free from the pain of being there, liberated from the guilt of knowing that it was I who made her step onto those tracks in front of the train. It's over. Thank you, Jesus. As I started back down the tracks towards where my family was waiting, I knew that I was walking out of my pain and into the freedom Christ had given me. And so I spoke aloud. Therefore, if Jim Dykus be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Mm -hmm. 
I think that accepting forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, may be the most courageous thing any one of us ever has to do. Because we don't need indictment from other people. We don't need others to tell us what we've done wrong. We know. We know. We're so aware of it. Little things, big things, silly things, horrid things, all of it together. We already know. And to pray this prayer says, I'm not just going to settle with forgiving others. I'm going to receive the forgiveness you have for me. Because at first I thought, it's easy to be forgiven. It's hard to forgive others. Now I realize, no, I had it wrong. It's easy to forgive others. It's hard to forgive ourselves. And to allow Jesus to fill our lives new and make us a new creation, a new creature. That's the challenge for us. As we go towards Easter, we pray, Lord, forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive others, to the same degree. So I want to encourage you to be generous in your forgiving others, to do it flagrantly, to do it without reservation, and then receive forgiveness just as flagrantly, just as freely. And we're going to be freed up people. We're going to know freedom for the first time. So pray with me. Lord, we need you so much in so many ways. And we pray that you would uh, give us the courage to take your hand and receive your forgiveness and cross the, the bridge to you. And give us the courage not to blow up the bridge when we want to and not to undermine things, and, but to trust you step by step, day by day, sin by sin, and trust you as you make us the new people that you have always imagined us to be. So we give you our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you.